Hello world, it's me. Let's talk about one of the greatest and long-lived vintage computer buses from the 70s. It's the STD bus, which was primarily designed for process control. As the title of the video says, STD was designed to be relatively cheap, but even better for us today, it was such a successful bus that hardware was mass produced for three decades. So today, STD cards and racks are readily available for reasonable prices. In fact, there are still companies that are making replacement STD cards, as well as unused vintage cards that are coming from supplies of new old stock and just hardware that's been buried in garages and storerooms. You can find STD cards for nearly any processor up to at least as recent as the 586 or Pentium. And also, it's not just an 8-bit bus. You can find the uh, STD32, which is a 32-bit bus. Now, STD was always intended to be a fairly loose standard with enough flexibility built in to make it easy to build around different processors, including the Z80, the 85, and the 6800. This means there's signal lines that are dependent upon the manufacturer and the processor, so not all cards will automatically work with any other card on the market. And that means that sometimes it does take a little bit of thinking and tinkering to get an STD system going. STD had the reputation for being very easy to get. It was easy to understand, easy to evolve as needs changed. It was easy to interface. And at the time, it was, it was a workhorse, and it was called the Blue Collar Bus by some. At its peak, there were 150 companies making STD cards for every conceivable I.O. function, as well as processors and memory and so forth. But STD was never considered to be a hardcore, premium, you know, multi-master, high-performance bus like Multibus or Versabus. You know, I came from the Multibus and the S100 background. I saw my first STD bus in graduate school. And so even while my perception is tainted from being an advocate for S100 and Multibus, I have to say that from the very first time I saw STD bus, it made perfect sense from the very first time I saw it. Multibus was a much more expensive with cards costing, you know, say an order of magnitude more than an STD card. And nearly every Multibus card did much more than any of the STD cards. But Multibus was expected to be far more standardized. So no matter what processor was being used, the bus was expected to meet the exact same standards and connectors were in the exact same location. Multibus was seen as more reliable. It could more easily handle redundant and multiprocessor systems. And it was an overall premium bus. You know, DEC did have the the Unibus and later the LSI 11Q bus, you know, there was the quad and then there was the dual. And these little dual width, you know, flip chips LSI 11Q bus cards are, they're comparable size to the STD. You know, you can see that they're a little bit bigger. Q bus LSI 11 is probably not a great starting hobby for the novice or the fate of heart, but I've never been a big deck fan, so I'm not a great character reference for the LSI 11. It'd be great if some deck people could weigh in where I'm wrong on, on that. Despite their cost and size, Intel's Multibus and DEX PDP, uh, QBus were strongholds. Motorola, Motorola also had the Exerciser bus and the Versa bus, which was the pre-VME. And of course, there was the S100. And while the S100 was much cheaper, it was still a bit clumsy for industrial control and it spent resources on the front panel as well as just physically being too large and unwieldy for you know, the target embedded control system application. And of course, while some people were going smaller with the STD bus, this was Intel's next great bus. You know, who remembers things like this BXP memory bus? The developers of the STD bus just felt that these overbuilt monstrosities like Omnibus, Multibus, and VME were just not suited for the majority of process control applications. And as a Multibus advocate at that time, I think they were absolutely right. Here's an n-gram view of different buses from the 70s through the 90s. And these are beautiful curves to show the onset presence of S100, Multibus, STD, and VME. If you're not familiar with Google's n-gram viewer, you basically pick some search terms and it plots how often that term is found in online print. And you can refine for various parts of speech, capitalization, and so forth. It's a great toy, but it's very much a garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. So the results are very dependent on small differences to search terms like capitalization. Here, I included various capitalizations of the names and included the word bus to get rid of a lot of the background. They are smooth, so there was actually a more abrupt onset when the buses were defined, and I should have, I should have set smoothing to zero, and I'll show you a, a different set later with the smoothing reduced. And on these curves, 
red is multibus, green is VME, orange is S100, and the blue is STD bus. On these curves, S100 is a bit problematic with its multiple names and the hyphen. Originally, it was the Altair bus, of course, and then later the S100, but it was used with or without the hyphen. So on this n-gram, S100 is most likely underrepresented because I had the hyphen in it. But if I use S100 without the hyphen, it brought in way too much background. So it is possible that this is fairly representative curve for S100, but I suspect a n-gram guru can sort that out for us and and show us the tremendous popularity of the S100. STD was designed and it was accepted to be far more capable and expandable than other contemporaries like the IBM PC, the Apple TRS, or any of the other microcomputer buses that I didn't even include in this graph. They're, those were all far too limiting for expandable control systems. In STD, each card was only going to perform a function or two, which meant that it would need backplanes holding a couple of dozen add-in cards for digital, analog I.O., motion control, steppers, servos, encoders, and so forth. And just like any of these other buses, there were trade-offs in cost, flexibility, complexity, compatibility, and capacity. So how did STD bus get started? STD bus was developed cooperatively by Prologue of Monterey, California and Moss Tech of Carrollton, Texas in the spring of 1978. And the story of exactly how this collaboration started probably depends on who you ask. From the beginning, it was conceived as a low cost, customized, build to suit, general purpose control system capable of supporting any of the most popular 8-bit processors at the time. Let's look at those processors. Here's another uh, engram view of that period, we can see the individual microprocessor peaks. In this engram, I include the manufacturer to get rid of the background for some of them with a unique name like the 8080 or the 8085 and the Z80, the curves look pretty much the same without the manufacturer's name because those are unique and there's not a lot of background for 8085. But for others like the 8008 or the 6800, they're just numbers and there's a tremendous amount of background and it wasn't really useful unless you put in the manufacturer like Motorola 6800. So these are obviously weighted towards those publications that would specify the manufacturer along with the number. But nonetheless, I think it's useful. The top dark blue curve is the Intel 8080. Next, light blue is the Motorola 6800. Next is purple, peaking in 82 for the 8085. Down from that is the orange Z80. Then the bottom ones are green, peaking early for the 8008. Blue for the 4004. And the two reds at the very bottom are the 4040 peaking towards the left and the 6809 peaking later. Now I know the Z80 doesn't show up as high on this as it should. And I know this set of curves depends on my particular search terms. If you're disappointed and, want, and you want your favorite processor to show up as being more popular at the time, just vary the search terms until you're happy. I just, I don't need to hear about it. The point of the graph is that since there was no clear winner in processors and things were changing very quickly, Prolog recognized that in order to maximize market share, all of these popular processors need to be supported. And that was actually just continuing Prolog's processor agnostic business model. Supporting all the available processors wasn't new to Prolog. While 95% of STD is straight from Prolog's historic product line, a bust backplane was actually a new design for Prolog. And I'll talk about what I mean by that bust backplane here in a minute. Just like Intel did with Multibus, Prolog and Mostec realized that success of a new bus platform would require on making it an open standard. That would increase the selection and availability of cards by simply increasing the number and variety of manufacturers that are contributing to the platform and manufacturers that are specialized in different things like analog electronics. After watching Multibus take the microprocessor the microcomputer world by storm, creating a proprietary bus would have been an absolute recipe for failure. And if they had done that, we wouldn't hear about STD any more than we hear about this old Intel BXP bus. It would have died out. Having an open standard made all the difference. And in fact, with their other board products, as well as STD, Prolog did one better than making an open standard by giving their designs and production rights to their large customers. So basically, if you bought 
250 copies of a board from Prologue, you were given the design and non-exclusive manufacturing rights to build that board yourself. So that's why you will see a lot of Prologue boards that they look identical, they're the same design, but they were made by other manufacturers because that manufacturer had bought enough boards that they then had non-exclusive manufacturing rights to that design. Of course, building boards back in the 70s and 80s was much different. You know, uh, board houses charged for every square inch, every hole, edge fingers. There was a setup charge for all the production films, for the copper, for the solder mask, for the silk screen. There was a surcharge for every via, charges for silk screen and solder mask application, on and on. And there were very long lead times. So even if a company had the design, there were huge barriers to building their own board. And Prologue was surely well aware of that, but it was certainly a good marketing tool to offer production rights to big customers. As I mentioned earlier, STD Target was embedded control systems, things like machine control, industrial automation, data acquisition and control. Basically, STD was designed to be a scrappy little bus. The theme was you know, small systems, small cards, small price. You can have Google's Ngram Viewer automatically show the most popular combinations of capitalization. And these are just the curves for the term STD bus, but let Ngram tell us the most popular capitalizations. As time went on, the original defined all capitalized proper noun STD BUS gave way to the more adjective like or acronym STD bus with STD capitalizes an acronym and bus capitalizes as a proper noun. And I brought this up because there's always the question is what STD means. According to the initial press releases in 78 and 79, STD was just meant to mean standard. It's not an acronym at all. But over the next few years in print advertising, Prologue decided to build on that by attaching STD with catchy taglines like simple to debug or simple to design or straight to delivery or any number of similar phrases to imply that STD bus was quick, easy, ready to go, and a readily available solution. And of course, another interesting story that now would be considered a marketing nightmare is STD obviously meant something else. Okay, well, I think that's enough for this video. Uh, the next time we'll play a little game of one of these things is not like the other, and it'll tell us how STD got its physical form factor. And we will also look at some of the history of what uh, Prologue and Mostec were doing at the time during the development, and basically how that all sorted out in the end. All right, well, as always, I appreciate subscribers and feedback if you have anything to say, and I will talk with you later. Bye-bye.